I'm Eric Newton, and this is The Together Show. We all know relationships take work, but what is that work, and how do we do it? As a former divorce lawyer, I've watched thousands of couples break up firsthand. Having seen the worst in relationships, I decided to try to help couples stay together. So on this show, we talk to real couples and find out what love really looks like. There's this noise that happens when you're just dating, or even if you're engaged, there's this notion that like if you have a bad enough fight, or if I piss you off enough, or vice versa, that like we're just going to end it and go, you know what, forget this. This is not for me. Last straw, I'm out. And that stops when you get married. The noise goes away. Welcome to episode five, everyone. Thanks for joining. Okay, here's some history. Omar and Aaron Passens were a couple in the eighth grade. And they were, let me tell you, a very hot item in junior high. And I know because I was there. I may, in fact, have been their biggest fan. And when they split, I somehow, I frankly could just never quite accept the fact that they weren't together anymore. And Omar and I remained close all through high school and all through college and into our careers. We lived together for a time in D.C. And during all that time, I would often bring up the subject of Aaron as in, Omar, you should call Aaron. Maybe see if you guys could, I don't know, get together or whatever. And he thought I was nuts. In fact, he used to get pretty annoyed with me for bringing it up all the time. But I am here to tell you, my friends, I called this one. They are so married and they are so happy. They are definitely a couple and they are definitely together. And all that adds up to that I was definitely right. But that, of course, is not the point of this podcast, although, yes, it is an important fact. This show is really about, in my view, the implications of being married to someone that you've essentially known for your entire life. Now, Omar and Aaron don't make much of this fact. And in fact, they downplay it in this episode. But I think it comes out in their every action. So I'll let you be the judge. And with that, let's go to Omar and Aaron Passens. I've known, I've known you guys since the seventh grade. That's the old the two people I've known the longest <laughs> that I'm still in touch with. Excellent. That's cool. And, uh, <laughs> and I, so I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. And it's going to be really interesting to ask about the details of your relationship. Because, I mean, I just know you as friends, but you've got this marriage. Yes. And I want to know how it's going. <laughs> Fill us in. Tell okay. Me. So I should do this because she never gets it right. Oh, so. come on. <laughs> Met in the third grade uh, at Encanto Elementary School, which is in San Diego. Uh, and we were in the same relatively small class. There were probably 20 kids or so. So we were in the same class for two years, third and fourth grade at Encanto. Then I left to go to a performing arts school where we met. Yeah. A year after we met, uh, in eighth grade, Erin followed me. That's, I don't know yeah. how she tracked this me down. This is where it goes well, sideways. <laughs> no. So See? anyway. so it's just it's Already wrong. Okay. Just to, uh, <laughs> move it along. I, uh, uh, so she comes in eighth grade, and um, she was actually my first girlfriend. First girlfriend, first kiss in the, in the eighth grade. We dated for some... Inordinate amount of time in third in eighth grade, and then uh, you know it, it did what things do in junior high school. We sort of went on and about our ways, and anyway, so that's how we met. And um, I, there's a longer story about how we ultimately uh, reconnected. Bottom line, after what 10, 12 years, I think it was about twelve years of being in different states because his family moved to Arizona in high school. Lost touch. There was an email back then. And so we, you know, wrote a couple letters and then sort of lost oh. touch and then got reconnected in our mid twenties as friends. We were both dating other people. And then at one point we were both living in Washington DC and that's when we actually started dating. You reconnected before she came when she and her friend Jim were considering uh, where they were going to, Go to a business school. But there were sparks. If no. I, was it my imagination? No, no there were not sparks. That's absolutely your I imagination. I have held the <laughs> torch for you guys uh, <laughs> you since have. the eighth grade. It's true. So I guess I must have imagined the sparks. No, they were definitely, that was the weird thing about us finally getting together is that there were not sparks, as adults anyway. Like yeah. when we got back together and met each other again as friends, we were friends for 
what, two years, three years before years, we actually started dating. And, and that whole time, there was nothing but platonic interactions. And there wasn't even flirting or anything. There was no undertones of anything. And that's why the night that we ended up kissing and, that, and moving forward from there, uh. and then there's alcohol involved, of course. But, <laughs> but yeah, there, Try to blame it on the alcohol. Uh, no, uh, she, uh, no, no. See just, here, he's going to go back into the fabrication. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, it, yeah. That's what I like about Erin. She knows what she wants, and she. Oh come on, <laughs> please. Yeah, no. So, so we we were friends as adults for a couple years, um, and then that last year that was in D.C. was the first year we were actually in the same city together as adults. Yeah. Um, and that's when we spent time together just as friends. We'd go to the movies now and then. We'd go grab dinner. We'd go catch up tell each other stories about our other people we were dating, which made it very <laughs> awkward when we actually got together to be like, oh, yeah, I, I know some stuff I probably don't want to know as your yeah. now girlfriend. And so so I'm curious about that first kiss. Yeah. It Was it like utterly out of the blue for both of you? Kind of. No. It wasn't for you? <laughs> oh, interesting. So, well, so this is what I'd say. Yes, um, it was. No. So... Yeah. so um, <laughs> Nigel and I, my roommate at the time, uh, hey, we had had some conversations and, you know, uh, like loose conversations and whatnot, but about Aaron as, as more than just a friend and the possibilities and that sort of thing. So it wasn't like it had never crossed my mind. Right. Uh, but it just wasn't a, wasn't where I was. It wasn't where she was. It just wasn't a thing. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think for me it was, uh, it was out of the blue. Like I remember having conversations with friends about, the the theoretical Omar, like I remember as, you know, a late 20 something thinking about what do I want in a partner or spouse or whatever. Um, and that was that was a period of time for me when I was in D.C. in graduate school and dating quite a bit and like never really finding anybody that sort of landed with me in a in a long term way. And I remember saying to several people at various times, like, I wish I could find somebody like Omar. Like, it's too bad we're just friends because yeah. I will. I, <laughs> but what's interesting about that is it never occurred to me to actually get him. It was like, I just wish I could find somebody who had those qualities. He had a lot of the things that I wanted. But it was just like, he, like he said, it was out of the realm of possibility because it was like, well, it was Omar. Like, if I could find somebody like that, that would be awesome. Yeah. And then that night that we had too much to drink, it was like all of a sudden, whatever that you know, veil was, was pulled away. And I was like, Oh, well maybe I should stop being a dumbass and yeah. actually look at this person. Cause <laughs> wow. The minute that we did kiss, this is the crazy thing. I was just telling a friend of mine about this the other day. The minute that we did have that kiss, I knew instantly, this is where he becomes the dumbass. I knew instantly in that moment that we were going to get married. Like literally that day, that moment, I was like, it was all of those feelings, that chemistry from eighth grade that you, as you get older, you dismiss looking back because you're like, oh, I was 13. I have puppy love. What do I know when I'm 13? But whatever that was that we had back then, it was like all that flooded back and like the way he smelled and the way his hands, like everything. I was like, oh shit, we're going to get married. Yeah. And literally that day, I remember driving home and calling my roommate like, you're never going to believe what just happened. And she's like, holy shit. And we had this whole conversation. And you guys have so much history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what though? It's funny about that. It is true, and I think the thing that that it lends more than anything else actually is not a history. It's not about our history individually. I think it does help in terms of there's a familial baseline associated with me already knowing important things about her family and vice versa, and that part matters. And our friendship circles, the types of people that we are. That part matters, but it's not like, oh, we've just known each other straight through for 20 years and whatever. That's We are adult people whose relationship has deepened as adults, right? Not people who had junior high and high school and Miss Gubatosi's class and whatever. I think that was a good foundation for us, but I don't know that it's what necessarily like keeps us together or anything. I think it's it was where we started. It's what got us going, but I don't think it's what keeps us mm -hmm. together. I'm really curious about history and and its impact on intimacy the because it, you know history is something that you can't get in any way other than time you need, there's a lot of other things you can do in life and in relationships that you can fast forward but but pure history this you're either together or you're not mm -hmm. or you've known each other or you haven't and um do you know joseph campbell the the yale mythologist who is he, you know he writes about archetypal myths throughout the world and the similarities between uh, all the mythology in different cultures. That sounds cool. For him was this idea that with your same partner, you hit a kind of renaissance at year 20-ish hmm. where you've just got so much history with each other 
that you've got a level of intimacy that that takes people beyond you know the the normal day in day out dealing with problems getting annoyed with each other marriage and so most couples they don't get to have that until their 50s or 60s in the modern era you guys had 20 years from day one really yeah i don't know about that though because i <clears throat> i think we're both thinking the same thing at this moment uh, because the even w what we had is a is a small chunk of that at a time frame when we weren't you know we weren't like even close to being a fully thinking human at 13 true and so what we really have is you know what a lot of people have like mid 20s probably um and and forward with a a little bit of like background yeah. stuff to work with right i think that's probably true so we still we're still working our way through the 20 years but i think we have other things that i mean from a yeah. Anyway, so I, I think there's a lot of reasons that 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 this works. Uh, I just don't know if the length of time that we've technically known each other off and on is that thing. But she is did say that that t moment you kissed, it was like all that eighth grade encoding was all about I, I, that it all rushed back, and it mm -hmm. was like, yeah, I, I and and I you didn't say this, I made it up that it was almost like I can trust this guy. Oh, that's tr definitely true. So I think in that regard, the trust thing, that's a good point. If if that's a part of what we're talking about in terms of history, then yeah, that's probably true. That there is this ingrained, like, I don't have to learn about you to know that you're legit or that you have good intentions or that you're a good person. I know your family. I know where you come from. I have shared, you know, stories with you as a child, basically. Um, so yeah, I, I do think there's something there. Maybe maybe we're even undervaluing that. That's possible. Um, because it was such a short time and because we were 13, I think it's easy for both of us to dismiss it as, well, it was just like junior high puppy love kind of thing, even yeah. though, you know, there were smooches and all that, but, um, not really all that. We were 13. There were smooches. Well, you tried. Whoa, perv. whoa. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> anyway, let's move forward. Um, <laughs> well, okay. There's another element of it that's interesting to me also, which, so conflict when, um, <coughs> it seems like. A lot of couples have fear around conflict, and the and and it's almost like they need to get to a level where it all comes out, and you know the honeymoon period is over. Nobody's trying to put on a show anymore for the other one. You, you, you know, you, they you pass hmm. gas in bed, <laughs> and you know your worst fears are manifest, and uh, you you have this blast knock down drag out fight and afterwards you're like whew okay that's who we really are now we can be honest with each other you two since i've known you have been really direct with each other when you're annoyed and you get annoyed <laughs> with each other a lot i mean y you get annoyed with each other like hourly and not big annoyances but it's just like ah don't do that and i think a lot of couples hold that back it gets bottled hmm. up but you guys are so, – and I'm making this up too. So I, I'm actually asking a question through the <laughs> statement. The question is, am I right? But the statement is, I think because of the intimacy from all that history, you can be honest with each other when there's a frustration and so you don't bottle it up and it comes out more naturally and easily. I think that's that's mostly true. Uh, it's interesting that your perception is that we get annoyed with each other on the hour – <laughs> I don't know that I feel that way. Maybe we behave that way, so maybe that's something for us to explore. <laughs> but I don't feel that way. But anyway, I think I think the comfort level maybe is is where you're going with that history piece. Like the trust, the comfort level. I can be myself. I don't have to sugarcoat things. I don't feel like we've ever had any sort of knockdown, drag out. This is who I really am. I think we've kind of started with that as the premise, which yeah. I think is maybe your point. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that is. I think, I think that might be true because I don't I, – I think we – I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like our relationship has evolved, especially since we've been married. Sure. I do know that's something that for me has been a shift, like from from dating to engagement to marriage. Like that has shifted for me in terms of sort of internal noise, but more from a female insecurity kind of like not so much do you know who I am truly, but like if we have a fight, are we going to break up? Like yeah, that so, kind of anxiety. So this is, this is an interesting point, actually, and you may have experienced this <clears throat> 
<clears throat> throughout these types of conversations. Um, I've had this conversation with a lot of people, and I think it's true, potentially for different reasons and whatever for different people, but I absolutely think it's true. Even if you've been living with a person for a while or you've been together forever or whatever else, and we'll say, oh, it's not going to change anything. It's not going to change anything. I think that just to get pl- married, yeah, to, yeah. to get married. Thanks. The, the, but the plain reality is that I think more often than not, it does change and it changes in a way that's a, that's a good thing. There is a commitment associated with <clears throat> choosing to be married to somebody that, um, that I think sort of, or for people who, who go into it with a feeling like, okay, marriage is, is different in kind from, uh, from dating that the result of that is that you get to a place instantly, basically, where you say, nah, you know what? <clears throat> we are in this regardless of what happens, right? And so we're going to figure out how to get through challenging things or whatever else because we've made this commitment and we're good with that. And we intended to make this commitment. So I think it. people say, ah, oh, well, it doesn't matter, whatever. I really do think it does in a good way. I, I'm mm-hmm. happy to be married. I always welcome people to the club. In the, <laughs> w- in the way you, – you mean in the way that y- – you're there. It's a. It's harder to get out. And well, I wouldn't say. I don't think know, it's harder. No, necess- I think it's. I, this is what, so I think that it's. There is a psychic shift associated yeah. with choosing to be committed in that formal way, where you stand up in front of your friends and family and loved ones and everything else, or whatever you decided to go to the justice of the peace, what have you. But it's almost like there's this shift where you just have said, "I'm doing this thing. I am deciding, at least in, in you know, we'll say." St- typical American culture. This probably exists in other societies or what have you. But when you make that shift to we are now, you know, deciding that we're not, you're basically pledging not to do, not to just walk away after a bad fight. That's basically what marriage right? is like. That's basically what it is. Like we, we're pledging not to walk away. Yeah, um, I think, I think that's what it is, is that when conflict happens, there isn't this insecurity about, oh no, are we going to have to talk about what this means for our long-term relationship? Are we going to break up? The whole are we or aren't we goes away. My One of my girlfriends right before I got married, she was already married at the time, and that's what she said to me. She said, I'm so happy for you that you're going to let go of the noise. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, I think women in particular, maybe this is true of men, but for me and for a lot of women I know, there's this noise that happens when you're just dating. Or even if you're engaged, there's this notion that like if you have a bad enough fight or if I piss you off enough or vice versa, that like we're just going to end it and go, you know what, forget this. This is not for me. We're done. Like last straw, I'm out. And that stops when you get married. The noise goes away. And I thought that was such an eloquent way of her putting it. And I thought you're totally right that, like, I know I could get in a, you know, horrible knockdown, drag out fight and want to punch your face in. But the next day we're going to wake up. I know we don't don't really get that far. But but I could feel that way, very angry, very frustrated, very whatever. And the next day we're going to wake up and still be married. And and we're going to have to work through it. And we're going to have to figure it out. And there's a... There's a comfort in that. There's a sort of intimacy in that. And there's a, I think, a, a happiness in that, that like we're, we're going to make it. And that's, I think, very cool. At least maybe that's how you should feel. <laughs> maybe if you get married, that's how we feel. Yeah. Well, the, w- that, what's interesting <laughs> to me about that is that that didn't come from the history. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. though you had your 20 years yeah, that's or a good more point. by the mm-hmm. time you got married, yeah, you, you still had the noise. Yeah. That's pretty amazing, actually. Okay. Okay, so um, what what else changes when you get married? Is that the – is that it? Well, this – so here's the thing. This is – we actually chatted about this a little bit. We were having breakfast this morning. Um, I think there's a temptation to try to create these st- these norms about – this is true for everybody. If you ask me, what changes when you get married? I can tell you what changed when we get married, when we got married, or what changed, you know, things that are true for us. But, for example, some people will say, well, you have to be best friends with your spouse if you want a long, happy marriage. I think that's nonsense. I mean, which is not to say we are very good friends, right? I mean, we're not going to play and pick up basketball or whatever, right, or, or, or whatever. You know what I mean? But, but we're, we're really good friends, and that works for us. But it doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody, and, and it shouldn't. We, we, we have this there's sort of this pressure to be, this is how you should deal with the fight. This is how, what type of friends you should be. 
we have what works for us, and we're trying to nurture it along. And like you said, you, we get annoyed with each other on the hour. I think I noticed uh, her mother actually will say that to you. Gosh, you guys fight all the time. And most of the time, we're not fighting. We're not even mm-hmm. annoyed with each other. It's just the way we, we interact. I can tell you that I can't, I can't even really imagine what the world looks like not being married to her. Oh, right? that's sweet. <laughs> it's really touching. Well, if you're just joining us, you're listening to The Together Show, the podcast about what's really going on in relationships. I'm your host, Eric Newton, and I'm here with Omar Passens and Aaron Passens, my two oldest friends. And uh, I want to shift the conversation to the to a fact I think is really interesting, but that I never considered really, which is the interracial component of, of your marriage. So Omar, you're a black man, Aaron... You're a white woman, and you're married, which in 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 our culture is kind of a thing. Is it a thing? It used to be a thing. Well, it's a complex issue if, in a lot of different circumstances. And I would say in ours, our world starts with us and sort of builds out, in my view. Um, and so even though I'm very involved in many ways in – San Diego's African American community in communities of color. I care very deeply about the success and future and opportunities for African American children and Latino children and Filipino American children, etc. But I, it isn't like I, I don't actively invest my own personal time in issues of importance to African Americans. It's just that one of the shifts for me, and I think this is a, a very, again, deep and complex. Com- uh, cultural issue. It's just that I no longer carry um, any of the weight of the belief that um, choosing to marry a woman who I love um, says anything at all about uh, my commitment to um, issues that impact uh, members of the black community. And before you thought that it did. Um, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I know it's a hugely broad question, and I probably didn't pinpoint it enough, but what came to mind for you first, Erin, when I thought of it? Um, it? Regional differences, I think, for me. Um, When we started dating, we were in D.C., which is a very black and white city. Um, It's fairly segregated, other than a very small subset of... Or it wasn't Yeah, Yeah, it was when we were there in the early 2000s, yeah. Yeah, That's fair. It may not be that way now, although I suspect it still is. But it... um, what was interesting is I didn't feel any uh, resistance or ill will or any of that from most people. But at the end of the day, it's not my problem. I mean, it's it's I am in love with who I'm in love with. And like Omar said, I don't wake up every day and say, I'm so happy to be married to a black man. Like, he's not a black man in my mind. He He's just Omar. Like, yeah. he, I, I, we, I wake up and it's my, my best friend, my partner, my husband. Like, he's just him. He's not a label. He's not a, you know, a an image of how I suppose how other people see us. Um, so for me, it's just, it just is, but I get that other people see us as an interracial couple and some have an issue with it. And quite frankly, I don't give a shit. Yeah. Um, but, but I used to, I think in the early days, I, it was very uncomfortable for me to feel like we were being looked at or in fact, the, the most recent time that we, experienced that <laughs> oh, was God. a couple months ago we went to little rock arkansas um, wow. to visit some of yeah. his um biological family um but the what was fascinating about it was it was like a window into like the 1950s or 60s it was really interesting but and it was exactly the opposite the first yes. day there we ate at a at a black restaurant for lack of a better term in it's a black portion of little rock and whatever and then later in the day in the evening we went to a place that was sort of predominantly white and yeah it was my family folks. that family all black. The people at the restaurants, all black. Very warm and, and welcoming. Yes. The the white people that we encountered in Little Rock, some of them. It wasn't everybody. And this is the problem with labels, right? Yeah. Is, is we were sitting at that one place, and the a guy next to us who described himself as a redneck, like that was his, his, his <laughs> self-description. Yeah. We had a great conversation yeah, with he, the, he and his wife, and it was like, you know, perfectly pleasant. So I think, I do think we should resist the urge to do, to overgeneralize, but we definitely, to Aaron's point. It was weird. Wow. It was like, and, and yeah, and Omar's and point is, was too. interesting. Was cool. What was, the, what was weird? The, the. Because the, everything you've said so far wasn't weird. It was nice. Well, yeah, what was weird was that the, the, whereas in DC, I felt more 
um, stank from the black community. In Little Rock, the black community was mostly lovely. It was the white folks who were rude and like this one guy slammed a door in my face. Yeah. I mean like blatant like looks and I mean there was to a point where I felt uncomfortable. Like I wanted to get us off the street a couple times because I'm like okay there's something going on here. And were I, you holding hands or were you just walking next to each well, other? Well you like, could tell we were together. Uh, you could yeah I mean so, okay. yeah. And I, and I think here's the interesting thing. So we, had, we actually had this really interesting conversation uh, with a young guy at an Italian restaurant that we went to. Oh, so yeah. uh, he was white, he was a supervisor. He was pretty young, though, maybe late 20s or so. And uh, then there was a, a busser who was an African-American kid that was with him, and they were friendly in that dynamic. And they, c- we all four of us got into a conversation. And to hear them talk about the racial dynamics the, was, was really, really interesting. I would say that my perception um, in that context, not that conversation, but being in Little Rock, it really did feel like there was overwhelmingly a sense that both most black people and most white people that we came in contact with believed that they occupied a certain position within the hierarchy of society and both felt, and and one subordinate to the other, and both felt almost like you're walking down the street. In a normal world, you're walking down the street and there's not enough room on the sidewalk. Both people will mutually kind of you know, just shift their shoulders a little bit so that you don't bum into each other. It's a subtle thing, but I, I can remember walking down the street and it was like, if I don't move, I'm going to walk into this guy. And we can clearly see each other. We're looking, at, you know, we're sort of like within mm-hmm. eye contact. Yeah. But but so it was almost like, no, no, it's your job to get out of my way. And I just, it was... Um, it is, that, yeah. that uh, I imagine that to be so... It's subtle, but it's so impactful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then layer that on all the other little subtle differentiations that that articulate that hierarchy. Um, it just must weigh on you. It must just it's, feel awful. It was rough. Yeah. I mean, we were we were there for what? Not even forty eight hours, <laughs> and we were like, "Get us out of here! This is terrible!" Like it was not a welcoming place. Well, for we us. well. So uh, just to be clear, it's a. We did not like that part of it. I really liked. We, there were some f- familial moments and the actual just experience of yeah, being Yeah, I mean, the reason we were there was yeah, great. That was fine. Um, but as opposed to other cities where we're, where maybe there's racial issues, but maybe they're so subtle that you don't notice, or, or we've been together so long, we just don't pay attention to that anymore. And if you're giving me st- st- side eye, I don't really give a shit. Like, whatever. I, we don't pick that up as much. But this felt like it was so blatant and so consistent with so many different people. Um, it was definitely obvious to me anyway. I, I felt it. Um, so yeah, it, it, even the coffee shop. Oh yeah. That every, it was weird. Yeah. It was, it was a strange experience. And it wasn't just regular rudeness. I mean like there's regular rudeness, right? People are yes. just like DC is famous for that it, in the like, service <laughs> sector in, in DC, mm-hmm. not all service sector, but if you go into like a coffee shop or whatever else, um, I find that there's a lot of, forget about race. It just, like you're inconveniencing me to come in here and ask for a cup of coffee. So there's that type of rudeness, but this uh, was a different thing. So, but I'd say, I mean, the bigger point I think is ninety five percent of the time, maybe even more than that, we don't feel anything, and, and it could just be our own filter on the world that we, you know, we don't look at each other and see our race, or like I said, I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, you know. Yeah, it just is. It's just who we are, and we're together. And, we, and and maybe that's some of that history that you talked about earlier, that maybe that's part of it. It's just, you know, we are who each other are, and we love each other for that, and it isn't. we don't see that. And I think even our families, collectively, we have a fairly <laughs> diverse family as well. And obviously Omar's parents being white and having ad- adopted and fostered lots of other kids from different backgrounds and our sister-in-law being Filipino and our brother-in-law being Latino. Like we've, we've got the rainbow coalition of, of family members. So I think here in San Diego in particular, um, we just don't feel it very much at all. And that was the other thing about Little Rock is that there wasn't any other races. There was no Latinos. There was no Asians. It was weird. We, we connected, remember we connected on our flight back home to, in Vegas and it was such a, an interesting, uh, I don't know, observation that we, we're in Little Rock and it was like black people and white people and that's it. And they're very much separate. And we got off the plane in Vegas and it was like, oh yeah, okay, this is normal. Like all kinds of people from all different backgrounds and everyone's talking to each other and everyone's friendly with each other. And they say, excuse me when they bump into you. Like, remember that guy yeah. with the luggage? Sure. Yeah. And 
and and that felt like oh yeah okay this is real normal life at least as we know it yeah. and that was like just some strange microcosm of the you know south the, the one last thing i would say uh from my perspective about uh being in an interracial couple <clears throat> and i think this probably applies across a lot of um culturally different um marriages partnerships that that, that arise um sh- she is more sensitive to the notion that like I don't ever get to forget that I'm black just because <laughs> we're we're married like you know even though we don't typically face it in San Diego because of being interracial it's not to say that you know even once or twice in the neighborhood where yeah, I live right true. so uh that that something something it's it's never so far from my consciousness and she has never uh, uh realize, never said like oh you're you know d- overreacting or you're you don't get this or w- what have you people aren't really doing that there's n- there's never been any of that and i think that's something uh being open to the notion that my experience of the world is just a little bit different because mm-hmm. of that um especially this country because it's we're, we're only you know 13 14% i think that's a that is a useful important thing that allows us we never have arguments about, well, you're overreacting. And I'm not an overreacting type of guy anyway, so it's not, you mm-hmm. know, a, a big thing. But that's true. I've never but I think that. that that's Im- that's important because those things happen and they matter and they're they're real to 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 my experience. And sometimes they're actually <laughs> real. And you know, so mm-hmm. I just I think that that's true. That's one of those like you know lessons learned. If you're going to do this, don't be afraid of terms like white privilege or male privilege, right? So nobody in America other than maybe Donald Trump, right, would would say, uh, you know what, men don't have an advantage over women in American society, really anywhere in the world, right, but, but in American society. No question. Yes, there's definitely privilege. You change that and add a sort of racial thing on there, something else, and all of a sudden people are like, what, no way, are you kidding, this is crazy. Her ability to, or just her worldview that allows her to say, you know what, Life isn't great for everybody all the time, and some of that is related to the way people view your skin color. And I'm not going, uh, I'm not going to, to devalue your experience of the world by saying things like, what is your problem? This is a you thing, not a them thing. Without, while still having enough trust that we can have conversations about, well, tell me a little more about it, right? We can have that conversation. And there's something that it sounds like Aaron has found a really important balance that I, I think we can all probably learn from in in all of our friendships. And you articulated it, but but I'm not sure I totally understand it. It was something like acknowledging that you're having the experience that you're having without trying to fix it or downplay it. Yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty good description. I, I have always felt that. Um, even if she didn't understand something, right? And th- that happens, right? Even if she didn't understand what the issue was, there has never been a circumstance where she would try to sort of, oh, you're just you know, sort of thinking that up out of thin air, that what have you. She recognizes that there are certain experiences that I may have. Uh, some of them may not actually be what I think they are, right? And I And I'm aware enough to realize that but she realizes that there are some experiences I may have that she can't understand um, and it doesn't mean that they they didn't happen it just means that she can't understand them so she's really good about just saying okay let's have this conversation or share what you need to share and I don't I don't need to you know try to solve this problem or 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 what have you it's just a, a conversation and mind you we're talking about if I'm really being honest I would say less than one percent of our of the time of life that we have is spent on this particular conversation. It just is not, um, you know. We both care about a lot of other things, um, and we care about each other, and we like to do a lot of things. And we don't, you know. The, in the end, I think back to the point of you know being together. For us, you know, it's it's about our our relationship, not about many of the other things that are out there. Yeah, I think for me, there's that notion of sort of just honoring rather than dismissing his experience is is very much driven, at least in part, by my own 
experience as a woman in business, which is often, especially in my world as a business owner and working a lot in corporate America, especially with leadership, which tends to be relatively male dominated. Um, I experienced that not all the time, but probably as frequently as he experiences those little moments or those little subtle things. Um, somebody calling me sugar or honey or asking if I can type up the paper my first or year of business the, school. the or, man <laughs> sitting next to you if yeah. there's something important. Yeah, just all those little things that are just sort of part of being a woman, especially a woman in, in business and, and, a, and a female business owner. Um, I get that. And it's hard. And if you... If you, if I was trying to try to explain it to someone else, it would be a little bit difficult unless you experience it yourself. So, I, it, while it's certainly not the same, it's I I get that there's something, at least metaphorically, similar to what he experiences, and I there's no way for him to feel how I feel, and there's no way for me to feel how he feels. So I just honor it, and it's it is what it is. It's it's funny. I don't think we've ever had this conscious conversation, but I'm I'm glad that I do what you need because <laughs> I don't think I was trying to. And I, yeah, that's a beautiful <laughs> fact about it. Uh, and what's also clear is that it's not the end of the world. This doesn't define either of you. No, not it's at all. not the the issue that drives your life and choices and interactions. But it's a fact, and to downplay it would be dismissive, just as it is to downplay any experience that your partner is having. It's dismissive, and that's not. Mm-hmm. How you build a healthy relationship. Yeah, it's not, I do think, that I was saying earlier that I don't think that there are many sort of universals, but I think, in, in my view, but I think you just hit on one, right? I think me you know, minimizing the experience of your of your partner because you don't understand it or you don't share it or you don't, you know, you don't, you don't agree with it. But it's, there's, that's really just ca- almost categorically a recipe for disaster. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, that's just dumb. Yeah. So, yeah. Agreed. That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. You two, I think you two decided not to have kids. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Was that a tough choice? Uh, no. So <laughs> my recollection of this is that uh, we never had an explicit conversation about whether we would or would not have children um, and before we got married. And at some point, relatively early in our marriage, this is the way I remember it, we just both arrived at the notion that we were not going to have children and we would you know, spoil our nieces and nephews and some of our s- friends' children type of thing. But, but um, not a, a hard decision at all. I'm, there's a lot that I want to do. There's a lot that she wants to do. And there's a lot that we want to do together. And y- there are no... There's a couple plants, but there's nothing, there's no pets, <laughs> there's no children, there's nothing that has to be like sort of gotten home for a specific time for. We have the liberty to do with our lives what we want to do with our lives, and, and I appreciate that. I like it. And I think my, my <laughs> recollection is that we had a clear-ish sense that it may or may not be right for us, that like, well, if we end up having kids, that could be a good path for us to go down. But if we don't, that's okay too. Like we'll kind of see where it goes. I I knew, at least in my recollection looking back, I felt like I knew that neither of us were 100% wed to, oh my gosh, no matter what, that's one huge goal I have in my life is to have children. I knew I didn't feel that way and I knew he didn't feel that way. But I also didn't necessarily know that he absolutely didn't want to have kids. And I, I didn't absolutely not want to have kids. So it was it was kind of this openness, I guess, when we got married, at least in my mind, as like, well, we'll see. But then he is correct. That's where I think our memory is aligned. Is very shortly after we got married. I don't remember if there was one conversation or if it just sort of evolved that way. That we're like, yeah, you know what? This, we like this freedom. I guess. I guess at that point we were like, well, if we're going to do this, we probably have to do this now. And I don't think I really want to, so maybe we shouldn't. I don't remember how that all went down, but I think we did very quickly agree. Like, yeah, you know, I think we're good. I'm kind of disappointed we didn't pay more attention. Like, I would like to have a clear answer to that. Yeah, like, oh, remember we were sitting. Remember at this the day, day we went here and we had this? I don't remember yeah. that. My kids are great, by the way. I, you know, I like kids. Yeah. I mean, you know, somebody it, needs to keep the planet going. You know, well, it was just an easy conversation for you both. Is the interesting thing about it? Yeah, because that, that's an issue that's hot button for a lot of people. Yeah, for you two, you just whoop, whoop. Yeah. you went yeah. a lottery aligned on that one. There is a topic that I'm curious about with the two of you, which is. Omar's entrepreneurialism mm-hmm. and Aaron's, what, what's the opposite? What would you call it? I mean, you are an entrepreneur, you're a business owner. Mm-hmm. No, here's what it is. It's Omar's risk tolerance and your risk aversion, Aaron. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And the what this leads Omar to do is to get very excited about new projects, pursue them for a little while, and then often drop them. And this is something that I do too. And it, you told me last time I was visiting that it had annoyed you desperately for years. And finally you had an insight, which, uh, what was it? How does it go? The three times rule? Yeah. <laughs> How does the three times rule work? <laughs> so um, you're calling me out here, Eric, because this is supposed to be a secret. I think he knows about it now. I share this in my, my seminars that I teach because I think it's really helpful for other couples and even people that you work with. So one of the things that my work illuminates is the way that we as human beings like to think about ideas. Some of us think about ideas and very quickly go to action. Some of us like to think about ideas just because they're fun to think about. Um, some of us like to think about really impactful ideas and how we could change the world with those ideas. Like we all have a different filter or lens on how we create and, and think about ideas. And then the subsequent decisions that will lead to action. And so for me, when I have an idea, it is almost always something that I have been thinking about in my head for a little while. Like, oh, this might be a good idea. And by the time it comes out of my mouth, it is relatively well thought through in terms of the actual action steps that I might take. Like, well, I think this is something that I might actually do. And, you know, when I'm ready to talk to someone else about it, I... I'm ready for sort of constructive feedback and let's talk about could this actually work and let's how, how does this get implemented? And I have learned over the years in, in doing what I do that there are a lot of people, and Omar, it sounds like maybe you as well, Eric, are one of these people that like to talk about ideas for the sake of ideas that may or may not actually turn into something. So I have learned um, over our marriage and also in the work that I do that um, it behooves me to roll with it a little bit when he has an initial idea because to him an idea is exciting and when he wants to initiate a conversation around the idea it doesn't actually mean he's going to go take the steps to do that and get a small business loan and actually you know execute whatever that thing is so the example I often give in my seminars is the rooftop deck so (laughs) so you know years ago if Omar had said to me you know we should do babe we should make a rooftop deck like wouldn't that be cool my instant reaction would have been... What's it going to cost? How are we going to pay for it? What are we going to do? Yes. Why are you bringing this up? Oh, my God. Yeah. This is making We don't sense. have money do for this. About? Do we even know about the structural integrity of the house? Like, are you kidding me? Like, we don't have time. Like, all I would have gone all the reasons why this wouldn't work. And to him, rightly so, this is perceived as total negative Nelly, total buzzkill. Why are you always shooting down my ideas, right? And I'm like, why are you talking about this? this is fucking ridiculous shit. Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? So we just missed each other on that. Now, and this is, again, following through the same example, now, for example, if he says, you know what, babe, we should make a rooftop deck. I will roll with it. That is a great idea. You know, I bet that's a really cool view from up there. We could have a cocktail. I bet you we could put some lounge chairs up there. That'd be awesome. I wonder how we'd actually get people up there. Would be a st- spiral staircase on the side of the house? You think that would work? And I will just roll with it. And that totally feeds his need to sort of ideate out loud. And it feeds my need to go like, okay, we're not actually going to do this. Now, here's where the three times rule comes in. If he brings up the rooftop deck over the course of the next couple of months, more than three times, then I start to sit up and take notice like, oh shit, he might actually start talking about this. He might be calling architects. But typically that never happens. Not never. 10% of the time that happens. And that's when I start to pay attention. But I will allow myself to sort of let go of my tendency to strategize the outcome and just let the ideas sort of roll. And oftentimes it's kind of a fun conversation for us because they're always like, you know, we should do, we should go to Paris. Okay, let's go to Paris. Let's talk about that. I'm not not talking about budget. I'm not talking about time of year. I think it's snowing in Paris right now. I don't go down that whole reality road. I'm just like, that would be awesome. Wouldn't Paris be great? When should we do that? You know? And then two weeks later it's gone and it's out of his mind and we're talking about something else. And I think that has been something that has really helped again he wasn't supposed to know that it was a secret for a long time that i did that but now the cat's out of the bag does but it work yeah yeah i i think it does um i think that um the notion of s- strategic thinking takes a bunch of different layers and levels and whatnot and so it 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 works for us that type of type of interaction Th- this would make a huge difference in my relationship with Aubrey. I, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to take this clip and I'm going <laughs> to send it to her tonight. 
<laughs> because we just, the most recent fight we had, the only one we've actually had in a while, was over something like this. Because for me, the articulation of ideas is how I process them. Mm-hmm. It, it, and I, I, I usually know that they're not ideas I'm really going to follow through on. But I do think that maybe there's a kernel that's going to lead to another idea that I'll talk about, which will lead to a third and a fifth. And maybe the 50th down the road will be the IBM. Thing. It's going to be like, this is the one. Yeah. This is the thing I wanted. And I love the process, and it's how my creativity expresses itself. And when I bring up ideas with Aubrey, she immediately <laughs> goes to, what are you talking about? Like, here's what's wrong with it. Here's this thing. Here's this thing. Like, why, why strategy never takes the form of, oh, here are all the ways this could work. Right? Or here are all the cool things about that. Strategy never takes, excuse me, well, your strategy does not take yes. the form of, like, oh, here are all the strategic ways to get this thing done. This is cool. This is cool. This is cool. It's always like, there's a problem, problem. Well, problem, so that's problem, an problem. interesting twist to it, right? Is that's one of the conversations we've had in the past is that what he perceives as my version of strategy, poking holes in things. What he doesn't realize is that actually is what I'm trying to do is eliminate all of those holes and all of those potential obstacles that I see in order to get to, well, what could we do? But what it looks like, and I get that, is negativity. It looks like I'm shutting him down. And so it doesn't do either of us any good because we both just get irritated and it spirals out of control. Well, what a great interview, guys. Thanks for letting me be here. All right. Now, I like to end shows with a quick game of this or that. So I'm going to say this or that. You guys are going to choose which one you prefer. Let's see. I, I had had I had some original ones for you guys. I gotta write these things. That's down. good because I don't know this game. Uh, well then, all right. I'll start off with an easy one: um, a stout or lager. Stout. Stout. Mm. If you had to either completely give up drinking beer, or completely give up gatherings of more than four people. <laughs> That's easy for him. Which one would it be, Omar? <laughs> Yeesh. I can't even believe you're thinking about this. No, no, no. I, I, uh, as long as I could still talk about beer and spend time <laughs> thinking about it and stuff like that, I could Obviously. give up the actual drinking part. I could not, I think, in, no in any realistic world, Mm-mm. stop having large gatherings. I actually was planning a couple today. Um, that she doesn't know about. <laughs> could you, you could keep talking about beer and not drink it? Yeah. I would think that would drive you crazy. No, not at all. Mm-mm. Well, I have, I'm supposed to ask the same question of both of you, but it's obviously not as hard for you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah uh, you could easily give up drinking beer for okay, that. Yeah. Right. yeah, fine. Okay, um, would you rather be able to run a million miles an hour, like the Flash, or be bulletproof. I think run. That's interesting. So I would say be bulletproof because then think about all the like conflicts I could go into and have conversations and try to like sort of have dialogues <laughs> and try to figure out can we <laughs> hey can we come together because then if somebody's crazy or whatever and they want to shoot me it's not a big deal we can still have the conversation and keep going yeah. so that would oh be yeah God. I'd be totally yeah definitely That's bulletproof hilarious and that I, would be perfect for you I yeah never... I really would I yeah, I, didn't, I didn't take that angle I thought well no one's really shooting at me generally so I'd probably want to go fast efficiency see yeah <laughs> okay. Um, would you rather have enlightenment or a billion dollars? And it's not both. I needed to make that clear to somebody in the last show. It's either or. Like spiritual enlightenment? Like you're just enlightened about... A billion dollars. Yeah. I, I uh, a billion dollars. I, I, I don't really know why I'm asking. I kind of yeah, want to rather have a billion yeah, dollars. I, I don't... I, I can't yeah. imagine what in life... Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't even know. I, I, part of it is that I don't know what the hell enlightenment means. I feel like I'm a pretty <laughs> grounded, reasonable guy, and a billion dollars is something tangible enough that yeah, I could we say. We could travel forever. I mean, you could we think could pay about all the house. things that, all the problems in society that we, we could, could solve, solve with directly oh, yeah. with a billion dollars. There's a lot of very low hanging fruit things that could be solved with a billion dollars. And, of course, not our own debt and our own sort of traveling and spending time frolicking and mm-hmm. gallivanting. That is so cool. <laughs> you were the first couple that didn't even think about it. <laughs> You're like, give me the money. Is yeah. it because you – well, I think partly it's because you're happy. 
you guys are just happy. Well, that's true. So there's nothing for you to yeah. achieve. But but um, is it because you don't you kind of well you said you don't know what enlightenment is, but is it also because you just don't kind of believe in that mishmash? No, I I just think I f- I feel like uh, we, or I'll speak for myself. Um, I feel fairly centered. Um, if you, you could have put a lot of things on the other side of that dichotomy that would have caused me to maybe take a moment's pause. Enlightenment just wasn't one of them. Um, but, but, um, you know, so for example, if you had said, do you want to be a hundred percent healthy for the rest of your days on this earth and you'll live till the average life expectancy of a man or whatever, or, or we give you a check for a billion dollars right now. That's a yeah, much. That's, that's easy. You know, that's health. Uh, see, that's to me, that's mm-hmm. much much harder, right? Because I don't know how long I'm going to live. But if I'm going to live with a billion dollars, like I don't know, I'm only forty. I, I could live for another twenty five years, and mm-hmm. now I've got a billion dollars. Or I could know with certainty that I would have health the rest of my life. The average life expectancy is like sixty five or seventy five, whatever it is. Sixty five. I don't know. Seventy five is what I meant <laughs> to say. So that's like thirty five years where I know I don't know how I'm going to do financially. Actually, now that I talk about it a little bit more, I think I would switch and say health. Because I have the, we have the agency to build additional resources. Yes. This is a perfect example. Gets the idea, get develops the idea through talking about it. You see, right? This is prime example. <laughs> it is. Okay, last question dovetails on what you were just hypothesizing about. If you had to either live forever, or die in the next five minutes, which would it be? Well, that's morbid. Could we both live forever? No, we, you have to answer individually. Oh, I feel like we should write it down. Uh, so, okay, well, whatever. This is a created example. Um, if, well, if we were going to live forever as we are right now, um, I would take that um, without thinking twice. In this hypothesis, though, you don't know. The genies just come out of the bottle. You can't ask any other questions about it. It might be live forever with health. It might not be. Yeah, I still think I would yeah. choose that. I don't want to die in the next five minutes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Live forever. <laughs> Does anybody ever answer that, die in the yeah. next five minutes? A lot of people. Oof. Really? That's Oof. so sad. A lot of people. <laughs> well, they're, they're, the way that they come at it is, um, you know, they've seen the vampire Lestat and living forever. Oh, yeah, we hate those really movies. Really lonely and terrible. Oh. And the, or they come at it from the science perspective, like, you know, there will be an end to this universe. There will be the heat death of this universe if our current physics understandings are accurate. But they are going to keep living through it. It doesn't sound so good. But you're going to exceed it. You'll pass it. You'll be just you. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like, the pr- associated with living forever <laughs> is not being able to die. So all these things that could happen, ah, the heat, whatever you just said, all that mishmash craziness. Yeah, no. Especially and now since we both answered it in the affirmative, we get to be together. Yeah. See, I think you'd have to, in order to yeah. survive that being completely alone in the vacuum of space for eternity, like in order to... We wouldn't be completely alone, by the way. We'd be together. I, maybe. <laughs> maybe you would. <laughs> oh, that's right. We could, I suppose, 500 years from now, she could be like, okay, I'm over this. Or the, or I maybe she chooses die. death in five no, minutes. No, I mean over me. Because oh. you guys are no. you guys are in separate rooms and you're answering this question with the genie. I mean, she may be say dead and you choose forever. And ugh. yeah, that's true. That could be a problem. Yeah, so this is this is collective extroverted intuition right there. I'm like, yeah, really, this is such an esoteric. Like, are we really still talking about this? <laughs> Not logical. That's a perfect place to close the show. <laughs> Exemplifies all of our personalities. I love you guys. We'll see. You. Oh, Thanks, Eric. Both soon. Cheers. Well, in the studio to help me recap the show is Charlie and my producer. Hey, Char. Hello. So, Omar, my best friend since the eighth grade. Yes. And you you know what's funny? You kind of geeked out a little bit being able to interview your friends. (laughs) It's kind of funny. You can, it's cute. You can see you're just like, I've known you forever. There were like parts that you're just like kind of giddy and you're so excited and happy to be interviewing him. It's, I thought it was great. Yeah, I love him a lot. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's the person I've known the longest. And Aaron, too. Aaron and I weren't close friends during all that time. We knew each other. Mm-hmm. But Omar was my boy. And, you know, I've just, I've, I've seen him through every phase. That's awesome. 
yeah, it's, it, cool. And it's cool to have somebody like that. You know, it's very, you know, I've have I have a couple of friends that I've known like that my whole life, and I just thought that that's how it's always is. You know, you always have a friend like that, and then I come across people that are like, I have nobody that I know from when I was young. Yeah, <laughs> and that to me is it's a little foreign to me. So it's and I, I lo- it's great that you have that you have that. Well, anyway, as to the interview, Omar, uh, what did you think? They're they're a feisty couple. They are, and, you, and they don't even know it. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I think you pointed that out in one in one part where you're like, you guys, like, I don't know if you said nitpick or the fighting or or annoyed annoyed with each other every hour or something along those lines. It's, it's way more than that. It's like every you know when you're hanging out with them, it's like every 15 minutes one says something to the other. Mm-hmm. That's how they talk to each other, and, and it's like it's perfectly effective for them right and i mean like and that's i mean it could be just like this level of comfort and honesty you know that you just there's no filter it's like yeah. you know like you, you don't have to be you throw caution to the wind and you could say you're know, like i don't care I'm gonna tell exactly what I, your face is annoying me. Right. <laughs> you're the look that you're giving me right now is annoying me i'm gonna tell you <laughs> which which leads to the point that i was making that they also didn't believe me about which is that being together your entire knowing each other your entire lives makes a difference right it just does mm-hmm. on the on trust and as you're saying comfort level and just knowing that that person's always going to be there it's huge yeah it is it really is and um one of my takeaways and um and I think it was, it's great timing that we're doing um, Omar and Aaron uh, right on the heels of us releasing uh, Jen Jen and Noah yeah. a couple of days ago. Is that I? They kind of they they said something pretty much almost exact. Is they were talking about the the way the mar- that marriage doesn't make or that being married changes from when they were just dating because it gives you like this no takeaway rule that you can't just get up and walk away. You know, uh, Aaron in, in in this episode was saying, I could get up and um, I'll, I'll wake up tomorrow and I'm still married to Omar. So if I'm annoyed or if I'm upset or if we had a fight, I can't just get up and go, you know, like if I was just dating him, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to pack my bags and I'm going to leave and I'm, I, can, I can walk away from this. But being married, she wakes up the next day and I'm married to this guy. We got to figure this out and... We got to work through it, and we got to talk through it. I remember Noah saying the exact same thing. He's, I think, as he put it, he's like, "I'm gonna take my dog. I can't just get up and take my dog and and, and get out of here." I, you know, that marriage gives you a certain level of accountability, and these guys practice that as well, or or recognize it. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, and you know, it's funny because some couples say that they don't notice any difference at all, mm-hmm. uh, but it just seems to me like that. That extra level of accountability, it impacts the way that you have disputes with each other. I'll just say real quick, I love that three times rule that Aaron came up with. Mm-hmm. It's so it's just so important for my relationship with Aubrey. Aubrey, if you're listening, <laughs> let's apply this starting today. Huge, hugely important for me. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to us on iTunes. It makes a big difference. If you have any questions or comments, or if you would like to be on the show, please reach out to us via one of our social platforms. You can find our website at www.together.guide. Our Facebook page is Facebook slash Together Show. Twitter and Instagram are both Together underscore show. Or you can email me at host at Together.guide. Our producer is Charlene Goto. Our web designer is Courtney Munna. Our art director, and my one and only, is Aubrey Pick. She's the whole reason, folks. The songs The Jazz Piano and Happy Happy Game Show were provided by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Thanks, Kevin, for all the amazing music. Special thanks once again to our friends Omar and Aaron. Guys, I'll always hold the torch. Be sure to tune in for tomorrow's episode in which you will hear... Jealousy is a word that covers over a lot of things. It's actually not not an emotion on its own. There's always something underneath it. And so for me to feel what is it, where is the... Is it an insecurity? Is it a need to control or possess? Which, you know, that will come up. That's all for today. See you next time.